Science advisor to the president of the United States, Michael Kratzios, just explained to Palantir co-founder Joe Lonsdale why winning the AI race isn't optional for America and what worries him the most might surprise you. And in one of the key areas of vision, you're a key architect of the White House's AI action plan, right? And so, so broadly speaking, why does it matter for us to lead in AI? Couldn't we, could we catch up later? Why do we have to lead now? Like, what, what are the stakes and what are you doing about it? Yeah, so AI is by far our number one tech priority uh, for this administration. And we believe that we are in an AI race and we need to win it as a country. This is critical for both our economic and national security, and we see it, and the president has expressed explicitly himself what an imperative it is for us to win. And the way that we think about winning that race is essentially in three categories of work. The first is around leading in innovation and in R&D. And that means that we have to create a regulatory structure in the U.S. that can allow AI applications to flourish and to thrive. And we have to continue to fund the critical recent development, which are going to allow for the next great breakthroughs. The first was transformers that ultimately led to the large language models we have today. But there will be something next. And we need to make sure that that discovery happens here in the U.S. The second is around infrastructure. We have to make sure that we have the energy and the data centers necessary to power the AI revolution. Yeah. We know that we have the best chips in the world, and we know that right now there's more than enough to go around here in the US. The challenge we have is hooking up those chips to a grid and being able to actually power the data centers that we need to, to drive this forward. So lots of work is done in the, in the action plan and how you can expedite permitting and lots of other things to get these, get these things built. And the third is around international engagement. And this is something that I take very personally because I spent many time, a lot of time, maybe far too much time in Trump 45, running around the world trying to convince my counterpart tech ministers to rip and replace all the Huawei that they had built all throughout their networks. Spyware. And the <laughs> challenge that we face today is that um, the AI that's going to be adopted in all these countries could be even far more dangerous than have nefarious telecom technology. The AI that a government chooses to fine tune in order to do or run their healthcare services, in order to do and fund all of their, their treasury services or anything else that, that citizens may use, that's going to be a critical, critical, critical decision that governments make. Mm -hmm. And they we hope we'll be able to choose an American stack. So a big third part of the, of the plan is to export the American AI stack. Make sure that countries around the world are using our technology, our chips, our models, and our applications, which are best in the world. So tell us, what does AI mean for the American worker, right? So I mean, a lot of people, we were talking earlier, uh, people are worried there are going to be jobs that are destroyed. Like, what are the new jobs that are going to be created? Is this technology going to benefit those who are left behind? And how do we think about it? My view is that ultimately there is there's no question this technology will be a boon for the workforce. This is a technology that can uh, help enhance the American worker, but more importantly, it's gonna create so many new jobs that we don't even know what they are yet. And we've seen that throughout time. I mean, the, the classic example always that people always give is the turn of the, of the last century, the vast majority of Americans are working in, in, uh, in agriculture. Today, it's less than 5%, and we're at full employment today. The question is, how do we navigate through that transition? And that's where it's critically important um, for us to develop kind of very um, sophisticated and, and, and well thought out workforce training programs and do as much of education AI as possible. And a lot of the ideas that you shared earlier about the way that you can reform some of our technical schools in order to motivate the type of workforce training that's beneficial is really important. The second thing we worry a lot and think a lot about is AI education, especially in K through 12. This is something that the First Lady has focused on personally herself and the President signed an executive order on. For us, it's critical that we teach America's youth to understand how this technology works. It's not about how a student can maybe use ChatGPT to like help them do their homework. It's more about teaching students to understand the limitations of the technology. Where should this AI be used? Where shouldn't it be used? Where does it work well? Where doesn't it work well? And I think the better that we can educate America's youth, the more, the more attractive and, uh, they will be to the workforce as they, as they grow. A couple more questions for you. As you look at the landscape, Michael, of all the emerging technologies, your job is to be looking at everything going on, AI, quantum, nuclear, the space race. Yeah. Like, what keeps you up at night? What concerns you the most? I think what keeps me up at night is, is that we as a country do not adopt AI fast enough. To me, when we ask our question, when someone asks a question, you know, you always keep saying we need to win the I race, we need to win the I race. What does that mean, Michael? What does that mean? The answer to me to that always is the U.S. has to lead in adoption. We need American students, 
We need American workers. We need American industry. We need American government employees. People need to be using this technology. And we can have the best models in the world. We can lead all the leaderboards. We can be at the very top of them. But if no one is using them, um, we're not winning. So that, that's where I, I stress. Quick bug, stuck trying to figure out AI, I made a course that hands you the complete blueprint. I made this course breaking down the whole industry, covering the cutting edge models, the chips, the data centers, and every critical component, and most importantly, why this matters so much. New lessons will be added constantly as AI evolves, and the price will be going up 2 to 3x Sunday evening. Secure the cheapest deal today, check the link in the description. America has to win the AI race, Catching up later isn't an option. Michael states that making AI is the number one priority. And his strategy has three parts, leading in innovation by funding breakthrough research, building infrastructure to power everything, and making sure other countries choose American AI over the Chinese. The stakes are massive. Both the United States and China view AI dominance as a matter of national security with winning expected to bring an industrial revolution and information revolution. Whoever leads in AI will control the technology, running hospitals, armies, and entire economies. Think of AI like compound interest. Once you get ahead, you use that advantage to pull even further ahead. The leader's AI helps them develop AI faster, which helps them develop even better idea, and the cycle keeps accelerating. The gap doesn't stay the same, it explodes, and America is not safely ahead. It's very neck and neck in many areas. The AI infrastructure challenge shines a light on something most people aren't paying attention to. America makes the world's best AI chips through NVIDIA, but those chips are worthless without electricity. AI data centers consume staggering amounts of power, enough to run small cities. Building more chips doesn't help if we can't plug them in. The bottleneck isn't technology, it's energy, and that's why Michael is focusing on fast tracking data center construction and power grid upgrades. The international competition is where things get really interesting. When governments choose which AI to run their healthcare systems or treasuries, they're not just picking software. They're deciding who gets to see all their data. When governments choose which AI to run their healthcare systems or treasuries, they're not just picking software. They're deciding who gets to see all their data. If a country runs on Chinese AI, China effectively has a window into everything that government does. China isn't waiting for markets to naturally adopt AI. The government is forcing adoption everywhere simultaneously. Meanwhile, America is relying on companies voluntarily choosing to use AI. This creates a winner takes most dynamic. Once China locks countries into their AI ecosystem, switching becomes incredibly difficult and expensive. All the training, all the infrastructure, all the formats, everything gets built around Chinese standards. Countries become dependent and that's geopolitical leverage money can't buy. So winning requires leading in technology and infrastructure. But Michael says what's keeping up at night is something more fundamental. Michael worries less about building good AI and more about whether Americans will actually use it. His answer surprises people. The real concern is whether America adopts AI fast enough. Winning means leading in adoption. American students, workers, businesses, and government actually using the technology daily. Having the world's best AI model means nothing if they sit unused. On jobs, he's confident AI will create more opportunities than it destroys, just like when farming went from employing most Americans to less than 5% without causing permanent unemployment. Most people obsess over which AI is technologically superior, but technology sitting in labs doesn't determine winners. Widespread adoption does. Companies that use AI become more productive and grow faster, which has helped them expand hiring. The productivity boost from AI only matters if people actually use it. Right now, America is adopting AI, but it could be faster. China is taking a different approach as their government is mandating adoption across industries. They're not debating whether AI is safe or asking nicely if companies want to try it. They're implementing it everywhere, learning what works through massive real world testing. American factories not using AI operate with the same efficiency. Chinese factories using AI optimize production constantly. After 10 years, which country makes things cheaper? Every day America delays adoption, China pulls ahead in practical experience. They're learning which AI applications actually work at scale, which ones fail, how to integrate AI into complex systems. That knowledge becomes an enormous advantage. Building good AI in a lab is one thing, knowing how to deploy it across an entire economy is completely different. And the jobs argument is an interesting one because fear kills adoption. 
If workers believe AI only destroys jobs, they'll resist using it. Unions will fight it. Politicians will regulate it heavily and adoption slows to a crawl. When AI handles just a few tasks in a job, employment in that role often grows because workers focus on what AI can't do, critical thinking and creating new ideas, for example. AI doesn't replace workers entirely. It handles the boring, repetitive parts, freeing humans for the interesting stuff that requires judgment and creativity. But only if people actually learn to work alongside AI instead of fighting against it. The winners will be people who understand where AI works well and where it fails catastrophically. That judgment only comes from deep understanding of how the technology actually works. The regulatory piece connects everything too. Too many rules and American companies won't adopt AI because it's too risky or overcomplicated. Then Chinese companies adopt aggressively while facing fewer restrictions. They'll gain years of practical experience while America is still filing out compliance paperwork. The country with smart regulations that encourage adoption beats the country with strict regulations that slows everything down. Adoption also creates network effects. When lots of Americans use AI daily, companies build more AI tools for American users. More tools means more reasons to adopt. More adoptions means more tools. The cycle reinforces itself. Ads are expensive and people don't trust them anymore, but they do trust YouTube. That's why three of our clients now make $100,000 a month for their business from growing a YouTube channel. If you run a business, book a call with me and I'll help you map this out.